Cam, Chris, Kiernan. Kieran. Kieran. My bad, dude. I just had it right too. It's better than Gary. <laughs> I know it's better than Gary. My bad. I'm sorry. Super nice guy, and I've already screwed it up twice already. But um, thank you for coming, my boy Cam from Foundry. You are the second person from Foundry we've had on. Yeah, here. you guys had Jeff on here. Had Jeff on here. My boy Jeff. But you're the tallest person from Foundry. Yes. We've had on. Oh, Jeff, you didn't hear that. Shot fired. <laughs> But yeah, thank you for coming. So Foundry, CWP, and yes, we will. Ha- I'm anxious to have you guys come and explain what you're doing because the little bit we've talked already sounds pretty cool. Absolutely. Um, and a little bit different from what a lot of groups are doing already. So if you're watching on video, welcome to the shit show because this is yeah. number two of the day in our marathon while everybody's in town for Empower. Eating pizza. Eating pizza. We, we started off with whiskey. Now we're moving on to some tequila and some mezcal. So sorry. This is this is what this is what you get to work with. So that's how we roll, man. Quick overview. Do you want to start? Just give a quick overview for Foundry for people who don't yeah. know. Yeah, and then um, we'll do the same thing on CWP side. Quick elevator on Foundry. You know, Foundry is the world's largest uh, Bitcoin mining pool, and you know, helping decentralize hash rate. We're built to decentralize the infrastructure. So Foundry is a prop miner and a mining service company and a, a pool provider in the space. So, Chris, tell us about CWP and, and yourself and all that. We want to hear kind of where you guys' yeah. backgrounds and all that stuff. Absolutely. Um, so, we work with uh, CWP Energy. Um, I help head up uh, CWP Energy Solutions, which is the client-facing business of CWP Energy. Um, CWP Energy uh, started in 2012. We are a power trading uh, company. We specialize in renewable intermittency, um, congestion trading, uh, volatility trading, and um we really got into um, the power trading game uh, when renewables started to really impact the system. And what we do over at CWP Energy Solutions is we look to focus that experience and expertise um, on curtailment, um, renewable build out, and then work with our clients to help them better manage um, kind of contractual risk, like basis risk, curtailment risk, volumetric risk. Um, and we kind of put our trading tools in their hands and uh and kind of help grow their expertise in that space and and structure partnerships that way so is it like uh it's almost like demand response right but behind the meter more so essentially you know if you have uh, a renewable project you know if you want to build a Mm -hmm. renewable project you have to go uh, to a bank or a corporate off taker and and get a a 10-year um purchase agreement for that power and then um they're going to say, perfect, we're going to purchase your power at the nearest liquid settlement hub, and your project is located over in XYZ area. Um, you're supposed to manage that risk of where your project's located to where the project settles. Um, and then you kind of generate, um, obviously, your revenues based on what you're paid at your project location, but you owe. Mm-hmm per that contract, um, revenues based on that uh, settlement location. Okay. So there is some dislocations in the market, but you need your project built, so you need your project financed, and uh, that's where we come in. All right. That's good. Kieran, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I work with Chris. Chris had this uh, idea with our founder in 2021 uh, and basically built the business from an idea um, and I joined at kind of the end of 21 in this third quarter um, and basically came on and headed up our analytics function so we like to say Chris has the ideas and I kind of make them come to fruition and <laughs> makes it all work I wear a lot of different hats I, yeah. I do a lot of different things um, but yeah I, my background's mechanical engineering um, and then Chris and I actually have a uh, work background we met each other and i actually worked very closely with chris chris was somewhat of a mentor for me at tscg the utility in new jersey uh we worked on their real-time operations there doing anything from dispatching power plants to hedging in real time and doing some real-time financial um product trading um but ultimately you know we ended up going our different ways and then he gave me a call about this idea he had and it seemed exactly what the industry needed so i'm definitely more analytical um is obviously a by head up for analytics function but <laughs> that's ultimately how we came to, came back together um and as chris noted we work with a variety of different types of clients both generators and loads and we're at the end of the day doing a lot of day-to-day hour-to-hour management but also looking for the ability to get these things financed and essentially make them profitable because as i'm sure you're aware there are a lot of uh 
can be some assets difficulties. everywhere, right? Yeah. Right. Right. Definitely can be some uh, difficulties in that right now. What's interesting is we've talked so heavily with a lot of the oil and gas guys. Chris, obviously, just being the one that we just did, um, obviously talks about a lot of stranded gas, a lot of disadvantaged gas, things like that. So it's fun to kind of take this and now apply it to kind of the renewable side, right? As you were kind of alluding to, it's, you know, you're building out a lot of these large scale build outs and you just don't necessarily have the offtake for that kind of, you know, the transmission lines for, for those kind of um, uh, power projects. And so how do you monetize it? You know? Honestly, it's the million dollar question. Actually, yeah. probably more like a $50 million <laughs> question. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. There is such an influx of capital that are either focused on the ESG mandates. They want to get projects built or they committed to their shareholders to be, a, you know, reach certain carbon neutrality goals. So either way, there is just a, a pool of money that wants to get into the space. But, you know, due to COVID, there's been supply chain delays. There's interconnection delays in order to get your project cited and built and permitted. So, you know, theoretically, everyone goes and looks, hey, what are the most attractive areas to build a solar project? What are the windiest areas to build my wind farm? And so everyone kind of builds on top of each other until we reach a you know situation of oversupply. Mm -hmm. And when oversupply happens, that's when curtailment happens. And that's when people need to kind of manage that. So it's sorry to jump yeah. in there. It's funny though, because I guess it's not funny. It's something that people don't realize is the reality for so many of these different projects, like you talked about how many, you know, new wind programs or projects are going to come on, new solar projects, all that. Getting that power to market is a lot more difficult than what people realize. And uh, actually having an offtake where you can monetize that early on. And that sounds like that's what you guys have identified. That's probably how you got together with Foundry, I'm guessing. Do you, do you guys, can you guys talk about the relationship between you guys and how you're working together. I would hope so that. with you, but with you all being here, I hope I you can figure, yeah. openly talk no, about this. We, we can't talk about it at all. I step on my own freaking tongue again, but yeah. We can't talk about that relationship all right, at all. I, no, I no, no. want to make sure, so, you know, I'm So yeah, him. I was introduced to Chris from another contact at, um, at, they do like rec and carbon credit trading. And we were looking to get more intelligent on the energy side um, as a company and wanted access to power data, wanted access to kind of grid data start thinking about where we think the next round of sites will be built out and and also getting data for back testing power um at this time we were like just coming into the energy crisis of, of last year 2022 mm -hmm. and power prices all over the country were spiking and we were just trying to get a handle on a why b for how long and how can we avoid it moving forward and so we got in touch with chris at cwp and um you know started talking um almost weekly by weekly just trying to get more energy intelligent as a company and hedge our exposure to these markets and we were in an interesting spot because we host a lot of our machines um, in our prop mining fleet so we have energy exposure via our hosting partners um so they don't they don't we don't have positive control on that energy so we can't go out and physically secure power or hedge for that so we're, we had to look for creative solutions i'll, I'll let chris take it from there yeah, um, I'll give Cam credit. Um, Cam's the reason that we're, we're in the space in the first place. But I think where we really got involved is quite a few miners reached out to us in um, early 2021. They know that you know, most people that have curtailment issues, that have basis issues where they have their project built, but the prices are either negative or, or very you know undervalued. Um, and they know that we solve them from a financial perspective. So naturally, um, controllable loads, physical loads that can actually suck up megawatts um, are, are a great fit. And um, fortunately, we had some good conversations. And then we met Cam, who uh, has an energy background and uh, can kind of link some of the lingo together. And he's like, hey, I need data. Uh, I need some advisory on some of the stuff that we're working on. And we get to look under the hood of what you know they're working on at Foundry, and he got to see the capabilities that we had at CWP. So naturally, our, our relationship started from sharing data, advisory, and and now it's moved up to to managing and optimizing some mining sites and and working through contracts and things like that. What is your background in energy? Because you didn't really tell what it is. Yeah, so I, I know what it is, but 
I want everybody to know. Yeah, so I got if my you can start. Talk about that. I can also <laughs> All right. talk about that. All right. um, I got my start in energy right out of school. Um, interviewed up and down the East Coast. It's like 2012, late 2012, early 2013. Um, and I wanted to be in energy. I was at Pitt in Bradford, which is a branch campus. And I'm in Bradford, PA, the middle of the like, Marcella shell boom and everything, natural gas, everything, oil and gas is going on out there. I had friends dropping out of college to go work on wells. Mm. And so energy was everywhere. And I just kind of got addicted to it. I knew I wanted to be in the space. Um, interviewed up and down East Coast after college. Said I'm never going back to Buffalo, New York. <laughs> and uh, the first job out of college or the best offer I had on the table was um, at a mom and pop energy consulting company doing commercial industrial electric and gas hedging for for other people and um six months in at that company uh we got bought by nrg so i lucked into like a nice fortune five energy job yeah oh so um we were two companies doing uh gas and electric hedging and then we were a large demand response um early mover and demand response in the northeast for pjm grid uh, New York ISO, Ontario, and um, New England ISO. So that's why Energy got interested in the company. And we ended up uh, getting bought by them and got into cross selling uh, all the different NRG um, commercial industrial suite of products um, through that job and uh, naturally got the taste as Energy kept dipping their toes in renewables, um, got the taste for renewables and decided. I think it was 2016 i i jumped ship and went to a uh, cni renewable de- developer in new york doing um you know rooftop ground mount carport uh, renewable development so i was doing business development signing contracts but also managing the projects up until construction and then moved on from there to a more bigger regional player in in that um in that same space when did you first realize that you wanted to get into like the bitcoin like how that's going to interact with like bitcoin mining so two part story, I'll keep it quick. In 2012, <laughs> in my dorm, right before I graduated, one of my kind of techie friends introduced me to Bitcoin and it really resonated with me being kind of like a product of like coming through high school and early college of like Occupy Wall Street movement and like all that in the forefront. So Bitcoin really resonated with me back then. And I he convinced me to get like a Raspberry Pi miner. Oh, and like nice. I don't think I mined any blocks. Like it was completely pleb, like super novice, but it was like interesting. And I bought some Bitcoin, played around with it, and then like got the job, moved on, and I was like gone, you know, to the wind, right? Um 2017 rolled around, started seeing stuff about Ethereum, some of these other coins, and then Bitcoin in the news, and like got reinterested in it. And then it was like late. Late 2019, early 2020, I, you know, I got back in the space. I came fully orange pilled down the rabbit hole and spent the majority of 2020 trying to figure out where can I pivot my career from, you know, 10 years of energy and physical infrastructure development to uh, crypto. You know, I, I was in all sorts of altcoins and everything. Yeah. Um, and naturally landed on mining. Um, come 2021. Uh, Foundry started making noise and I realized that they were in Rochester. I was in Buffalo. I had a contact that I had previously worked with. I ended up getting a job there and, um, you know, spent six months and finally got hired and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much the fir- the perfect uh, schooling oh, on yeah. someone else's yeah. dime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is that is the best kind of schooling because I'm still paying for mine. <laughs> <laughs> brutal. But yeah, so I w- but you guys, when you got with Foundry, so what is the objective here? Now that you're with them, are you guys going to be basically acting with them to f- locate sites or like how, how's, what's the relationship? Yeah. yeah. You want to go? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Cam. Can we talk about yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Can we talk yeah, about it? Yeah, we can it? talk about it. So I feel like we're right. like disclosing all kinds of like deep, you know, deep yeah, secrets. So we, you signed some legal agreements, yeah, but I think yeah. you can advise us on those. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. We, Martin Legal, we can we advise like the, people on all kinds of legal matters. Nice plug. Yeah. <laughs> we we work with Chris and Kieran, and they've they've really helped us advise on you know different deals that come across our desk just on energy outlook mm-hmm. and whether it's looking at the past five years and kind of seeing how 2022 was an outlier in the natural gas markets, but be also being aware of kind of what the other risk could be moving forward, forward projections. And as we're kind of seeing these things come across our desk. You know, we're we're in the middle of the space. We're seeing all sorts of deal flow, both public, private, bankrupt, um, mm. and just 
trying to get more energy wise around the deals we're doing, whether it's a hosting contract for our own prop fleet, or if we're advising a company on investing in a new Bitcoin mining site in a deregulated market, um, just becoming more energy wise on it. And then naturally, the more we've talked, the more of those kind of conversations have gone and we don't have a mandate to go out and develop our own. <laughs> 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 oh, we can't, we can't, we can't the, cut that part. That's yeah, gonna, that's, that's, that's gonna stay. That's so the best feature of these chairs. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have a mandate no. to go out and develop our own greenfield site. So it's not sourcing land, it's not yeah. sourcing power. But we're also opportunistic. We're not going to pass up good opportunities, you know, when they come across our desk. And that's okay. kind of where CWP helps us identify what is actually opportunistic. Right. Two things really impressed me about you and Foundry in particular. <clears throat> or I guess Foundry and you in particular. First one is you didn't skip a beat after you just dropped your chair like that and bounced right back in there. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> Solid. But it's honestly- like, going? Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> How long wow. does that chair go? <laughs> um, no, that was like something out of a movie. But uh, Foundry really has, it, I've noticed this from the first time I started talking to you guys, and that was, that was a while ago, I guess probably 2021, early 2021. Um, yeah, it was very early 2021. <laughs> Um, you guys have shown a lot, put forth a lot of effort in developing like the energy, the knowledge on the energy side. It hasn't been, um, I have not seen any of the other groups that are, you know, pools or groups like y'all that have put an emphasis on really understanding the power markets, because I think that's obviously key in the, in this industry, but you guys have really put an emphasis on that. And every time I talk to people at Foundry, they're always asking a lot of questions about de deal flow and what kind of deals we're seeing and what route we're going, whether it be renewables, gas, whatever. They've just shown a lot of interest in kind of being educated on that side. So going back to you guys, now that you, it sounds like you're almost acting as like a consultant for you guys on kind of larger scale deals or maybe even bringing opportunities to them that you might know about. Is that part of, I guess, your business model? Are you guys wanting to be like a group that other folks can reach out to and say, hey, here's, we're looking for this type of asset and you guys might be able to like put them on one of those assets. Is that yeah. some of what you guys are doing? Yeah, honestly, a great question. We kind of fell into the mining space, so mm -hmm. almost on accident because, you know, the problem around the country is, is the more renewable build out, the more intermittency on right. the grid and relying on that intermittency can sometimes lead to very, very low prices or very, very high prices. So essentially, we're already solving that problem for solar and wind and, and, and other assets as well, too. Um, but you know, when we met Cameron and, and Foundry, you know, it kind of you know, synergized with our business model. Instead of solving it with financial solutions, you can also solve it in areas with you know, physical solutions. And, you know, in say pre 2021, a pre winter storm, Yuri, mm -hmm. actually in, in ERCOT, you know, everyone thinks as Texas power is being, you know, relatively cheap. So mining what makes the most sense, you know, we have cheap power, we want to fix price for our cheap power. And, and that's how it happened. Um, but now you look at last year, you know, power went through the roof, right. natural gas went through the roof. So miners or energy companies that were used to dealing with one thing now have to get very, very sophisticated in a very technical subject. Mm -hmm. So it was a natural fit between us and Foundry to say, hey, we have the tech technical expertise on the power trading side, and we're looking to partner um, with you know companies like Foundry. Large load companies and like, yeah. Large right. loads, you know, large loads are, are really a way to offset the total cost of the transmission build out. You know, if you're a large controllable load, you're essentially a battery storage asset that can't generate. Mm. And if battery storage assets can, you know, get tax credits, can, you know, be socialized amongst rate payers, things like that, you know, why can't controllable loads do the same thing? And you'll see when we have like a big energy event, you know, you can look at what happened in, in PJM and uh, Winter Storm Elliott, or you look back at Winter Storm Uri, the first things that come out are, hey, look how look how well load responded and load was able to curtail to to save yeah. the grid. And I think 
having more controllable loads and flexible resources is the only way to move forward and, and keep our grid balanced on you know day to day basis. I agree so much, and it's annoying that um, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a busy week. It. Yeah, but um, <laughs> the amount of people that don't understand that, and especially that are in the energy industry, right? Um, especially the power generation side or like y- utilities. I had a uh, little documentary I did with Bloomberg Green not very long ago. Well, we filmed it last year, but it just came out not very long ago. Um, And they cut out like my entire discussion on that part. And they they had one short little blurb in there. It was like where I was talking about kind of moving the load from, you know, uh, from Bitcoin miners to residential or commercial uses. And they basically were like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. We don't know what it is. But then at the end of it, when they actually brought ERCOT guy in, he basically confirmed exactly what I was saying, but they had cut it out coming from the mining guy. Um, and I think there's, you know, I, I think there's an active reason some of these groups do that. I don't, I'm not putting Bloomberg Green in that. I enjoyed those folks and, and mm. enjoyed, was happy to get the chance to visit with them. But um, that is a real thing. And you guys obviously are in the position to recognize that coming from the space that you're in. Do you feel like the miners are getting more educated to kind of this aspect of it where you got physical trades and then you got kind of, yeah, they don't have a choice. Well, have you seen a growth in them and how they understand The guys that are left have to understand that, right? Like 2022 kind of flushed out the inefficient capital to an extent. If Mm -hmm. you had a fixed power cost offtake and you were never able to mine because mm. you're passed through a cost of power that is unprofitable. Right. You're no longer producing revenues to pay off the debt that you use to finance your site. So you're they you're up there, you're you're not operating, right? Yeah. So it was kind of like an evolution of the industry that forced it upon people. And now you see very sophisticated players, founder included, where they're like, hey, not only is my mine producing revenue by generating and mining Bitcoin, but it can also be treated as a load resource. And there are other revenues that I can attain to lower my effective cost of mining Bitcoin. Are you, what about on the renewable side? Are you guys seeing more of the groups that are actually building out the renewables, identifying mining as this is an opportunity for us to go lock in some revenue while we wait for transmission lines? To, Absolutely. To the challenge, and that's where we come in, though. The challenge is if you think about a renewable resource, think about just offtake in general, right? Every renewable wants an as gen contract. I don't want any volumetric risk. I want perfect match. I get paid for what I generate, right? But a miner wants fixed power, or mm-hmm. they want 20 megawatts, they want 30 megawatts of power at this price. 90% so that, uptime. Yeah, 90% yeah, uptime, yeah. right? The two don't exactly Nine, mix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whatever, yeah, whatever the best thing yeah. is, right? The two don't exactly mix, though. Right? Like it, a renewable generator doesn't really want to wear that risk because they essentially have to provide megawatts they don't have. And the miner doesn't want to sit there and buy power, power they don't know the cost of. So CWP plays a bit of a role there ourselves where we can wear some of that volumetric risk. So you've got a you know wind generator, solar generator that you're willing to sell 30 megawatts off of. Well, if you're not producing 30 megawatts, you have to buy it from the grid. CWP can wear some of that risk and help. Okay. Help, it, we help let a, you... align the incentives. Yeah. Exactly. It's more of the uh, catalytic or the, the catalytic converter, the catalyst to facilitate the transaction because, you know, as initially when you get in and you bring up Bitcoin mining to a yeah. renewable asset, they say, no, thank you. Right. And, you know, volatility and this, that, the other. But you see if, Bitcoin mines can, or I should say Bitcoin mining companies can withstand 2022 where you have the news headlines, you have high gas prices, low Bitcoin. And now if you look at the assets, the way that we look, you know, they're, they're sitting as some of the most profitable assets on the grid right now. And you start to say, all right, you know, these companies have the energy sophistication now to make it through a tough cycle. And the other part of it is they spent a ton of money and a ton of capex to build some of these massive, you know, four or 500 megawatt sites. So you're going to live through a lot of different cycles, cycles of low power costs, low gas, low Bitcoin and, and vice versa. So 2022, they just all happen to align. Yeah, the <laughs> right. stars it was, align. It was a complete shitstorm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, but it's good 
for the industry long term, yeah. in my opinion. Coming certainly. into the fall of 21, no one in mining was like, right. energy costs. Mm -hmm. That's like, yeah, we all sought out the lowest cost yeah. of power, but none of us were out there thinking we're going to see cyclical high natural gas. No, I mean, I, I do. I was at Jay at the time, right? And I, I mean, this is me sounding like I was foreseeing mm -hmm. all this, but I, I did... I think Ryan and I both were like, this is not feeling good when you get gas prices doing what they're doing. It was, and you, when you looked at like the situation with like, you know, Russia hadn't really taken off yet with the Ukraine stuff, but knowing that if there's any type of upset, it could get super ugly. And it did. And, Europe um, was tight to begin with. right. Right. Yeah. Europe was already having problems and we're, we're exporting so much. But this is fall of 21. Right. At peak. Oh, yeah. Top. We're a huge mining like, revenue we'll through the it. roof. We'll be fine. A couple hundred Price dollars. Price only goes up. Hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were talking about that on the last episode. Like, yeah, everybody thinks that, and they'll do it again when prices go nuts again and we get another bull market. People are going to be dumb. They're going to they're going to get out over their skis and spend a lot of capital they don't need to spend. I, I do think a lot of smart capital will learn from what happened I think so late too. 21 throughout 2022. You know, there was right. a lot of people waiting to get in for the right time. Right. And that time's coming. It's, it it's either now or it's coming soon. I agree. And I, they're going to learn. The investment thesis is going to change. People aren't going to be looking for returns in 18 months. They'll probably separate their infrastructure CapEx from their ASIC CapEx. And, you know, hopefully that can help mitigate kind of the leverage flush that we saw in 2022. But. I hope so too. I just, the access to capital for miners is so bad. It, the money is so expensive that until that changes, there's always going to be like extreme busts like we've had with a lot of miners that are very visible and everybody knows who they are. And then it's like, sure. they're is it, is it just because it's so volatile and because it's so risky that the capital is so expensive? Yeah, right. Like the, well, and because the, the mining equipment goes up in value so fast, right. And it gets, and it's the same equipment that you're buying today for $2,000. You were spending over 10,000 back, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, and so I think that when you get put a loan out for that, I think you're now we're going to see like the, valuation on the the hardware is going to be it's going to be hard to get enough capital from somebody financing it when prices go back up that i it's going to be tough and, i think it, it had i think it had a two pronged you know both positive approach though from from both sides when you go through something like 2022 because it showed renewable energy companies and developers of these projects that we work with that said uh that's not for us too volatile but when you look across you know, the pond and you see an industry go through that. And then you see people come out the other side of that. You, you have to recognize and respect that. And the one thing that's been a knock against the mining industry, I think from the energy side is that it's not long-term. This is, you know, this is someone that's solving a flaring gas, or this is someone that's not going to survive 5k Bitcoin or things like that. But we've kind of gone through that. We proved that. And now our clients are more saying if this if there's an operation that wants to come in for three, five, 10 years from now, we're open to that. And, you know, he kind of alluded to it earlier and we skipped over it, but we have clients ask us, you know, we have a renewable project coming online in, in 2025. And we know that this transmission line will be built in 2028. And that's going to solve all of our curtailment problems and, and everything's going to be perfect. And we can procure very, very expensive financial hedges for that. Or we can work and kind of cite mining off take like in the hotel when we ran into uh, the guy from, you know, the uh, the landfill gas mining yeah, side. Who's, oh, OK. Yeah. Who's who's using that to finance his project in the short term in order to you know get the capital the and, and build his project long term. That's mm -hmm. one thing. And the other thing we saw is from the mining side you saw um, how miners thrived when, you know, Texas power was very cheap or any power in general was very cheap and Bitcoin was high. And then when those things converged and collapsed, now miners realize, well, we spent a ton of CapEx. So unless we increase our energy sophistication and use the same dynamic hedging <clears throat> trading approach that, you know, energy companies use, whether it's oil and gas or, or power, then we're not going to be able to live through multiple uh, multiple cycles because we're just going to have to sit there and curtail until the price is economic to mine. 
And so yeah. that's that's a dynamic that people are are getting more sophisticated at. That's good. Um, I, I brought this up on a I guess a couple episodes ago, but I I was in um, the Middle East and we actually met with a a nuclear engineer and he builds mining facilities or uh, nuclear facilities. And he brought up, he said they would mine Bitcoin if it was zero because of the value of and safety aspect of like a large flexible load like Bitcoin. Mine. There's really nothing like that. And it's obviously to me, it's the same exact scenario for a renewable group is that there's virtually nothing that uh, in a utility like a grid level uh you know a utility on on there is that from a stabilization standpoint and keeping the grid stable at 60 hertz there's nothing like mining it is virtually uh the best base load uh tool that really has hit the energy industry regardless of what type of of energy you're talking about um and that i mean i think when people start waking up to that and understanding it is a legit serious uh offtake for renewable groups utilities to use it as stable as a grid stabilization um you know generation for uh for um what we're just talking about selling gas back to the grid Mm -hmm. all the different areas where it touches is is virtually i don't know of anything like it you know what i mean from a from a standpoint of like the capital in and the amount of load you can take and turn it up and down so fast so and and the network doesn't care it just moves yeah, it on yeah it doesn't care right right you know at the end of the day right. that's what we're all here for on the mining side and it it becomes the best last case uh load or or even sometimes first off take in mm-hmm. certain situations because when you don't need it you can shed that load and yeah. provide power to the grid and the network just keeps moving on yeah I, I agree. So are you guys, I know you guys might do some mining. Um, and I asked you earlier, but why are you guys looking yeah. to get into mining and yourself and kind of, uh, I don't know, grow that side of your guys' business? Yeah, I think for us, it's something that, that we've certainly been exploring. Um, and at first it was one of those things, let's go back to maybe uh, mid 2021, like, all right, we're not going to talk about this. You know, it's not part of what we're doing. And then the synergies just kind of kept going naturally where we had some clients that we were solving these issues for financially said, hey, we would be open to permanently solving these issues. And then when you work with um, other mining companies, you start to realize um, this is this would be like a good example of, right. of how how your brain starts to click. We're going to a conference next week, which has all the, the biggest renewable energy players and banking players. And I I suspect most of the large heavy hitter meetings, they're going to be arguing about 50 cents a megawatt hour. Really? And we, um, what with our strategies last year, we added about 5 to $7 a megawatt hour on top of that. When you look at the mining side, we're talking more like $40, $50 a megawatt hour that... 50 cents a megawatt hour? 50 the, cents a megawatt hour. Geez. Hate to beat each other over the head for these 10-year PPAs that... Oh a couple of gosh. And so you start to look at the numbers and the, the numbers are just something that you can't ignore. And you look at the problems that they solve. You know, we see them solve problems for our clients by shoring up the basis issue uh, and getting their megawatts to curtail. So when you have a curtailed project, your prices are negative and you are forced to shut down. But if you have something on the financial side that enables you to run, you can run, you can generate more production tax credits, you can generate more renewable energy credits, which are valuable to the tax equity sponsors, which are valuable to the corporates that have those ESG mandates. And then you also are keeping your project going and living to see another day. I'm excited. We need to talk off after the podcast, because like if you guys go to the conference next week, I've been putting some deals together. We can put some deals together, guys. Especially you guys the connections with the renewable generators. Well, it depends how much time you have to uh, I got run plenty through the of time. I, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. We can do that. I saw before I came on here, there was uh, a, a, an article that came out. Um, I think Princeton University estimated that the grid, in order to get it to a quote-unquote modernized state, needs uh, $350 billion in investment. And, and that's going to be paid by ratepayers. Yeah. Right. That's, that's, 
Yeah. <laughs> Always is. That okay, you're probably going to where I'm going to say something about this. The peaker plants, right? That has been after we had Winter Storm Yuri come out uh, or come through what 2021, right? Yeah. Um you know, there was a lot of kind of attention on Texas after that happened. Sure. And our power grid and you know, it's not reliable and all this. The reality is it it, it I think we're as reliable a grid as probably any of them, but um, we went, we weren't prepared for that level of kind of weather coming through. Um, but you had a lot of people, even guys like Warren Buffett, come out and be like, you know, we need to build uh, peaker plants and all this. And he's an you know, anti Bitcoin guy, but um, that all that was going to be like, I think eight billion dollars is what they were going to uh, were proposing for uh, ten different peaker plants. That all was going to get passed on to the ratepayers, right, and consumers. Whereas you could use Bitcoin mining, which is private industry, come in and bring their own capital and provide revenue for these utility and for these renewable projects um, that is not going to be costing taxpayers and consumers additional revenues. And that's why, to me, this is like, it's such a wonderful tool for everyone because we're going to be develop a lot more reliable grid, um, cheaper energy because we're going to be allow these renewable projects to come online and build, give them time to stay afloat while the transmission lines are built out, which I think that's one of the biggest aspects of the, the infrastructure bill that was passed was transmission lines. But it takes time, like you guys are talking about. And so um, that's where I think Bitcoin mining is like, it is the ultimate tool for groups or to come in create jobs create tax revenues and bring private industry to solve a problem that the public the public suffers from so um yeah I, i'm a big fan of it obviously but. yeah i'm gonna see where i think like picking up on that mm -hmm. that 350 million that princeton quoted for the modernization of the billion. grid billion billion billion, yeah. billion yes of course the b <laughs> um the IRA is 370 billion of tax incentives. Really? So if you look on that on apples to apples, you know how much capital inefficiency is that? Are those tax uh, incentives you know going to have to go through? There's going to be some great projects. There's going to be some not so great projects. And capital efficiency is pretty much the name of the game these days. But if you have a battery storage asset and you're eligible for tax credits, or if you have a battery storage asset and you're eligible to say, hey, I offset this transmission project, therefore I can socialize some of the cost of my project via the ratepayers. Why aren't controllable loads being in consideration mm. for the same type of treatment? That's a good and point. so what we've been trying to work with, you know, Cam and, and other miners is to say, hey, let's go into the data and let's go into our power flow modeling and say, hey, you know, by building this controllable load or having this controllable load in the area, we were able to offset, you know, this amount of power flow on this transmission line. And that resulted in X costs to rate payers. And there's other companies in the energy industry that do it that says, hey, by building 10 solar plants next to each other, building that 11th solar plant doesn't have the same effect, you know you're just offsetting another solar plant being built. Mm. And I think it's important to realize, you know, when you put money into a renewable project, you put money into a capital infrastructure project, what is the impact of that project, both on, you know, from the ESG side, since that's very important for everyone these days, but also to the overall cost of the consumer. You know, if you're not offsetting the cost of the consumer, then are you really doing any good at the end of the day? You know, not not really. You're just kind of filling your own company's agenda and, and your own back pocket. So, yeah, there's plenty of people who like to do that though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but yeah, that I, look, I uh, I I'm glad to see the more kind of energy focused guys are getting into it. Right? Um, you know how it's been. Um, early on, it was a lot of kind of Bitcoin fans, which I'm all about. I'm a Bitcoin fan, but just for the maturity of the industry and to get more institutional money into it, I think you have to have kind of a new level of expertise come in and, and really to make the industry viable long-term, you have to take advantage of these type of opportunities. Right. And 
I mean, we're not in it for nothing. Right. There's there's right, monetary right. value to a flexible load, and that's what markets are designed to incentivize, right? So ERCOT's a great example of where they've got some more efficient market signals for the value of that flexible load. We call them ancillary services, but it's essentially the ability for a load to curtail to an extent to regulate grid frequency, right? Keep it at 60 hertz. So there's an economic signal to be there and there's an asset to capture it. And that's what we're looking to do is better capture those economic signals. And that's where we draw the comparisons between battery storage and flexible loads, right? Like battery storage, a lot of those valuations, we look at them come across our desk all the time. 80, 70% of those 10 year, 20 year valuations are ancillary services. It's not shifting power from one hour to the next. It's how can you regulate the grid? So that same inherent value that's available to battery storage is also available to flexible loads. And we're looking to capitalize on it. And at the end of the day, if there's a signal we had, we're traders, right? We're there to, to <laughs> <laughs> arbitrage that signal uh -huh. and capitalize on it, right? So that's the idea is we saw the opportunity. We saw the assets that were being built. We saw people who were doing it in a sophisticated manner and people who are doing it in a less sophisticated manner and looking to establish people or partnerships with the people that are <laughs> thinking about the same things we do. Maybe not the same concepts, but the gem premise of how can this asset make the most of its abilities. Right. Yeah, and it's about optimizing a kilowatt hour. Yeah. But when you add in ancillary services, when you add in demand response programs, you know, paid actual structured programs, not just economic curtailment, you're adding revenue to a project that previously was only making money by mining Bitcoin. You know, some people buy and hold, some people buy and sell everything. Some people have complicated strategies around that, but you had one revenue generator. Now you're adding different revenue stacks. You're increasing the pie for that project, but you're, you're allowing for each mining site that's doing that to be more resilient and less dependent on just mining economics. hundred percent. We were literally just talking to Chris Alfano mm -hmm. about that. Um, same type of deal is just diversification on your revenue streams is huge, especially when you don't have a hedging market, right? You, you guys effectively are the hedging market for, for a miner on the power side, obviously. Do you guys do yeah. stuff kind of nationwide or? Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, North America. Okay. Yeah, I'd say yeah, North America, obviously, Texas um, is a big focus, but SPP is, is also a big focus. So SPP, for, where's that at? It's I'd say from Oklahoma. Uh, if you go straight up into the Dakotas, hmm. um, would rep, re represent the SPP. Gas guys would call that the midcon. The, the midcon, mid right. yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Good job, man. So the, you know the same same issues. You know some uh, actually what two weeks ago the grid was powered by seventy five percent wind. Really? Guess what prices are when it's powered by 70 cents? Nothing. Yes. Less than nothing. Yeah, yeah Negative, less than right. nothing. You You're have to paying pay. to be online. Yeah. yeah that's so awesome. Citing, citing physical load, you know, that's that's not going away. You're not building a transmission line overnight or you're not all of a sudden popping up a, a ton of fossil generation on the other side. So what are you what are you doing in the meantime? Are you just sitting on the sideline and let your project, you know, Ha fa face those face those issues or are you being proactive about it and and with the ira it, it complicates it you have a rush you know another land grab more development in the renewable space so you have projects aging out of their production credits where now their competitors are sighted 15 miles away same transmission line and they can drive the price to negative two cents a kilowatt hour because they're getting paid three yeah. and the project who doesn't have a production credit now can't make revenue so they're just being curtailed ultimately so they they need a load to come in or else they're gonna have a distressed asset or, or already do and also it's not to say that there can't be you know, homeostasis we've we work through contracts where you know the mine and the renewable asset work in tandem where they say all right you know if pricing is below ten dollars you know the mine's fully operational between 10 and you know fifty dollars the mining has an arrangement, uh, you know, kind of a, a VPPA, a virtual power purchase agreement. Um, and then above, say, $100, the mine can share in revenues of the energy, curtail their load and then share in revenues of the energy product. So it, uh, it really creates a homeostasis around, hey, you're a flexible generator, you know, you're a flexible load. Um, or even if you're a renewable resource, you can still maintain that with contract flexibility and it kind of has both ecosystems coexist at once. 
It's the only way to align incentives. If you don't, you have two industries. One is pushing to sell power at the highest price and one's trying to get power for the cheapest. You yeah. just keep butting heads. So unless you have contract structures like that, that align incentives, or you have a vertically integrated kind of asset, it's the only two ways to do it. You guys are way smarter than me. Well, honestly, I was about to jump into that because maybe uh, the Martin Legal Group could, uh, could, <laughs> help, could oh, help. Oh, yeah, we can do it. We could, can do it. Could help on the contract structures because honestly. Oh, we can help on the contracts, yeah. The contract side of things is, you know, we we know the value of energy and what's going on. And the miners know the Bitcoin mining side and things like that. But we don't know once those two ecosystems come together, what's who's going to be on the right or wrong side of the contract. So yeah. we really focus a lot of time and have a lot of conversations to try and think through. And the only way to do that is to be fully transparent and say, hey, this is what we think the economics are going to be if things go terrible for us, if things are in the middle and if things are high and Cam or other miners have to kind of trust and and share that same you know relationship because these contracts are very new we don't really right. know and for us coming and trying to optimize a mining site the same way we optimize an energy site you know, all we want to do is create a, a contract that both parties earn their fair share of the contract and if we have to amend the contract or create some flexibility in the contract we're going to do that as opposed to many energy companies that have been very successful and grown to these big energy companies in the industry where this is our contract. Mm -hmm. Figure out how you're going to fit into that right. contract or the utility if you're trying to work out a rate structure with them. These are our rate structures for interruptible loads fit into that. And, and you're, and you're dealing with dinosaur fit. companies or, at that point. Yeah. Yep. That man, that's this is a brand new industry, right? And it's very similar to oil and gas, but it's still very new. And you can't just kind of cookie cutter contracts based on industries that are completely different than this. Um, there are, you know, certain, like from a business model standpoint, very sim similar uh, aspects to it, but uh, it's still a very new industry. And you got, yeah, competing, not competing interests, but you got companies that are trying to align, but they got very different interests and in, in models in that regard. But yeah, we definitely help. We definitely help on that. The only way well, you got to get like, in the same room as these guys yeah. and have have a few beers with them. Well, I'll do that. Or some tequila. Yeah. Uh, uh, Milargo, Reposado, Milargo. Select Barrel. All right. Well, thank you for the tequila. Jake, I'm, I'm, cutting, I'm, I'm cutting myself off, dude. Are you? I'm gonna have to cut myself off. Get a whole other podcast. Here. I know. We I'm gonna be asleep yeah. by like 5 p.m. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! I know you've been really quiet. So I know. I'm like, a lot of this shit's over my head today. I, was, <laughs> I, was I like, mean, energy and energy and mining is uh, is definitely something new. I mm. always kind of went through all of your old podcasts on the oil and gas side, and yeah. every single time I found myself going into my phone and adding in notes and saying. This is the same thing that we're trying to yeah. solve on our side, but you guys have already done it on the flared gas or, you know, intermittent side with, with a lot of the other energy companies. Those so wildcatters. What, what yeah. yeah, wildcatters. <laughs> what what type of synergies do you do you guys see, you know, in terms of the stuff that's popped up on the flared mining side and mm -hmm. also this, you know, basically synergizes you have stranded energy with curtailment on some of these days and you know, does that, does anything wreck? Or I think the stuff that we just talked about with Chris was really interesting. Yeah. The, the, the aspect of diversifying yeah. uh, your, your business model and finding ways to, now his is not flare gas. His is, they're buying their own asset, their own natural gas asset, mining off of that. And then they're looking for different ways to create some diverse revenue streams. So, uh, you know, power generation to, uh, on site to sell power to the grid when the price is right traditional gas sales mm -hmm. because these are tied in and he brought up a good point which uh we've talked about in the past on the show was the amount of flare gas that there is like when you look at just the number it looks big right but it's it's mostly it's intermittent flare mm -hmm. and so you don't have a ton of opportunities on the flare gas side everybody's fighting over the same stuff because there's like there's very few wells that are actually flaring a ton of gas on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll flare a lot when they IP the well and they bring it online, but that stuff drops off and then you got it tied into a pipeline. You're selling it. Um, I brought this up on the last episode too, but 
uh, we did a look at all the wells in Wyoming that had flared. And I want to say this was 2019, but uh, all the uh, gas wells or all the wells that flared in Wyoming, there was only like two wells that flared at more than 200 MCF for over 180 days during the year, two. Mm, wow. And so that kind of shows you that there's not a ton of flare gas sites where a miner could go build a company. You know, what so I mean? are it's, miners being mobile or are they moving around? They're oh yeah, they're in. You gotta you gotta bounce around to find these different sites, right? But um, and that has like a huge scaling issue too. It, yeah, yeah, it's a scale issue. And so if you want to become a big off grid natural gas miner, you really are gonna have to find a way to get fully integrated, like like Chris on yeah. 360. Um, Do you see a lot of midstream plays? I I think midstream is where it's at, honestly, because. They have so much gas coming in on a daily basis. Um, and a lot of these groups, I actually brought one up to him after the last show. A lot of these groups have what you'll call equity gas, which is basically it's gas they own, um, that they can do whatever they want with it. And I think educating them to the realities of the revenue that you can generate from mining is key because most of the time they just don't believe you. Like when I've told people we were doing $45 an M, mm-hmm. uh, they're like, bullshit there's no way and i'm like i could show you and even time sometimes i show them they're like no nah, you're not doing that right or you know they they argue with you about it. i'm like all right man i'm not here to like <laughs> to try to make you money you know what <laughs> I mean? but whatever if you don't want to do it then you don't want to do it um but it's we're still so early in this industry that like people don't understand enough about it we all are in the echo chamber right yep. uh, and you guys are probably in it too now. The we're getting the, there. The Bitcoin Twitter world, where it's like, it seems like we all know this stuff. It seems so common, and like, oh yeah, everybody knows. Man, there's hardly anybody that really understands. If you looked at it from a per capita standpoint, we're probably well under one percent of the people out there that, even people that understand the energy industry or industry markets, they don't get it. They don't understand it, and they don't like when they think of like. What when you talk about Bitcoin being energy, like well, it doesn't even make what are you talking about? But that's literally what it is. You know, it's that is what it is. That's and part so, of what we're doing together. Right. right? There's right. so much of a industry disconnect, but we're so dependent upon one another, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. your principal cost of mining is energy. And yeah, if you don't understand that eighty to over yeah, ninety percent of your right. outbacks in some cases is your energy. And we're looking at a huge influx of controllable lows, particularly in Texas, but across the country. And you've got utility guys that have looked at vertical demand for the entirety of their life. That's why they cut you off at Bloomberg. Yeah. They're used to that vertical demand curve. It doesn't move. So you mm-hmm. make it elastic. It's price responsive. Suddenly every model that's ever built ever to forecast power pricing needs to be changed because previously it was here's my supply curve where's that intersect with my vertical demand Mm. now i have a flexible load that's going to turn off at a hundred dollars per megawatt hour what does that mean (laughs) how do i how do i accommodate that like i feel like i understand it pretty good and i when you're talking i'm like what does that mean that's yeah that's why why karen runs our analytics department (laughs) he's 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 uh he's above his uh He's above his own in it's terms sharp, of brain, yeah. brain, brain capacity. But for us, when, when we come down here and, and what we're looking to do at an Empower this week is you know, we have problems from the energy side and we come down here and say, hey, these are the problems that, that our clients are saying. This is what we're trying to solve. I think it kind of synergizes with some of the stuff that you, are, you guys are doing. So how can we work through mm-hmm. this together? And the main thing we hear from the energy side is, well, wouldn't the miners just pick up and leave when the power prices go up? And so they want miners to to stick around and invest that capex and build these big sites Give that they want. PPA, but at the same time, yeah, yeah, at the same time, PPA. I have very very large, who I would say the large major renewable players, saying, "Chris, can you get a miner in here for three years?" With 100 megawatts of capacity that can, you know, at least provide me enough of a price floor or a revenue put so I can take that to my finance department, finance my project and get my project built. That's where I think we could help you. So like it's more about coming up with a deal structure that makes sense for everybody. And that is that's what we do at Martin Legal. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. It's 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 a great space to to be involved in, but you don't 
get these problems solved by you know being over Zoom or or not sharing details. First off, you know someone uh, who's a CEO at a company a couple of weeks ago told me trust and take risks. Mm. And in this industry, you have to trust other people who you're working with and trust across the inter- industry and be transparent with your information. And then you can work around contracts. You can work around earnings and things like that. That's a- uh, I'm gonna man. turn to the camera for this one. Trust, but verify. <laughs> Good job, yeah. True. That Spoken is- like a true miner. <laughs> right, I was actually thinking that too. <laughs> but. But uh, that is an aspect that going back to the oil and gas industry, that is just something that I noticed when I first got into it is nobody trusts each other and they're always trying to hide. And like as a landman, so I would go to the courthouse. This was like during law school. I'd go to the courthouse and you got people that are like guarding the books and they don't want to tell you what company they're working for and all this stuff because it's all big secret. And it's like, guys, look (laughs) – we all know who's doing what everywhere. It doesn't matter. And the mining space is not as bad, but um, it's it's better as far as like, I think being open about yeah, stuff. I, I find in the mining space, there's a ton of people who are willing to share knowledge mm-hmm. and data around the newest techniques, like think firmware, think software, think what suppliers are the best to work with. But there is a little bit of the caginess, and and oh, I saw yeah. it in the renewable development world. Everybody, it's the, it's the land grab, right? It is like, a land because grab. that's where the money's made. Yeah, you're right. But when you're coming to a table with a group like CWP and their energy partners, you have to be transparent. It has to be mm. open book, but you have to expect that from the parties you're with too, or else you're never going to get a deal done. And what's worse than spending months and not getting a deal done? I, I do it all the time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the worst. <laughs> We actually experienced that coming before here. We were like, hey, are we going to be disclosing the most attractive mining locations for 2023? Not yet. You're going to wait until we turn the camera off, and then we're going to work together and figure that out, and we'll knock it out of the park. I think you'll like my answer to this. I said, people that know what they're doing already know where they are. Uh, That's true. So That's true. That's part of it, too, though. right. Mm. Like We talk about the sophisticated players in this space. You can be open book because generally mm. everyone has an idea of what's going on. And if you talk about it and they're unsophisticated, they're likely not interested anyway. Like you're not, you're likely not inking it. And you won't be interested in the deal. Them either. Well, they right. can't see the value in the deal, right? Yeah. If I can't tell you what the value proposition is or you don't understand it, you're never going to sign it. So yeah. it's a bit of a, you know, you got to see eye to eye on things. And if you don't come honestly to the table, then no one's ever going to sign anything. That's true. And yeah, maybe when the camera turns off, I'll give you my alpha list. Yeah, all right, good, <laughs> good. That's what we need. I'm, we could do a lot together, man. Let's let's get some of this stuff done. I mean, I, part. honestly, uh, I think everyone knows. You know, West Texas, it's no secret. Yeah. South Texas is there, but once we start getting into you know SPP or or even get into the Illinois region where you have MISO and you also have PJM, you know, that's where everyone started to PJM is where I'm hearing a lot of. A lot, a lot in Ohio. Chatter and talk, yeah. But I just got off the the um, a call today with someone who advises you know, very large uh, renewable companies, and they're building tons of projects in um, in Ohio. So you also have it from the load side, and you have it from the generation side. So it seems it's a pretty, pretty liquid, good pretty balanced fight. And that's the thing; it, it's a liquid energy market that there's always a market made. There's always liquidity. So both sides can hedge. It's very transparent. Whereas other sides of the country, like SPP, there's not a liquid financial market. So there's not really hedging capability. And what we've been impressed by, I guess, in the past year, and you know, Cam's kind of a secret weapon because he already knows the, uh, the energy side of things. But when you have a liquid point to hedge, that is something that everyone in power knows, everyone in Bitcoin knows, everyone in gas knows. Because you can say, all right, well, if my project goes up or if it goes down, this is what I can do. I actually have a liquid marketplace to transact. And the fact that we're getting questioned by our mining clients now, hey, should I sell some of my power offtake in June or July right now? Gas has gone up 50 cents in the past three days. And as we speak today, it's gone down back 50 (laughs) cents. But last week, we got a bunch of questions that said, hey, we own cheap offtake at, you know, let's call it $15. Should I sell that and just, you know, create some cash flow and move on? And the fact that those things come to mind instantaneously now is is, is very impressive. And growth. The growth, sophistication, and mining companies are 
are going to be a big part of the grid in, in the future, whatever way you know they participate. Um, so that's why you know we're, and, we're in the industry. And the energy majors are taking notice. They are. You know they're they're watching. They're here. They're participating in some ways. Shell sponsoring Bitcoin twenty twenty three. Yeah, they should have been sponsoring in power. We're <laughs> in Houston. You heard it here first. You should sponsor. I don't know what they're thinking there, but <laughs> missed opportunity. Shell. Missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we're lost. Nice shell. Yeah. <laughs> I know that we said that we're not allowed to do uh, company uh, names on here, but if we were able to say some of the developers that are are considering and, and are involved in mining operations, we didn't tell you couldn't say company names. Uh, we, we were we were we were sworn. Oh, this is this is a pre powwow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but some of all of the largest renewable players are. Uh, are considering mining they're working with mines already so the whole stigma i think has really taken a peel back in our industry and it's like hey are you gonna put your hand behind your back just because you don't understand something right. well, i think that point is already out the door and, and i think giga does probably the best job on their pitches which i've seen some are like brent's yeah, pitches. Yeah. man he's incredible um but they they pitch everything as infrastructure play, which it is, right? And it and that's flare gas stuff. But that, that's one of those areas where it is identical. This is an infrastructure play that allows you know power generation to kind of thrive, and yeah. that's what it is. People right. ask where the next wave of capital comes from. It's big energy. It's infrastructure mm -hmm. funds, ESG mandates. Whether you want to, whatever your right. opinion is on ESG mandates, is. the money's coming. And we had slide decks that had production tax credits, renewable energy credits as slide seven, slide eight. And we realized that we have to move that to be slide one because you need tax equity investors to be in your projects if you want to take advantage of the IRA. And corporate companies are investing billions of dollars in energy and they need renewable energy credits. So when you have something that's saying, hey, my renewable project can produce even in a negative price environment, and by bringing mining into the forefront, this is one of the tools that we enable to produce production tax credits, to produce renewable energy credits. How are you going to hit your 2030 100% renewable mandate? without all right. the tools in your tool belt. And is. those guys are getting smarter too. We talk about like inefficient capital deployment and market headwinds weighing on revenues. Like the off takers have seen some of that as well. They're not alone in suffering from some of these basis risks we talk about, right? So talking about everyone kind they have of- have to wear them more now. Yeah, we mm -hmm. talk about everyone trying to get a little bit more sophisticated. They're coming to the table because they know. They see the value in it. They understand what they can get from it and now everyone's more open to the conversation because they know more yeah whereas before it's like what? why would i entertain that when i can just buy a project at this fixed price for 20 years and not have to worry about it well they're going back to that off take and realizing it's losing them 10 mm. it might have been not the best idea how do i resolve that right and some physical off take can help resolve that there are more creative structures that you can take and help resolve that so we've seen it everywhere right it's not just in the energy seller, it's not just in the mining, but also in the buyer as well. The offtake sees value in it. And for the CWP guys, you know, one of the biggest issues for miners that I've seen over the past two years is the access to hedging products. You know, and there's a cost to play the game, but there's a cost if you don't play, right? So if you don't hedge, you you could pay the ultimate price. And we've seen it happen a few times. You want to come pitch with us next week? <laughs> <laughs> let me let me talk to the events team. <laughs> That's literally part of our challenge though, right? Yeah. And Chris talked about it a little at the offset, but when things are going well, it's very difficult to tell the story that now's the time to hedge, yep. right? Everyone wants to hedge when you're losing a ton of money, when your asset's underwater. And, and when, that's the worst time to do and it. And that's the absolute, you're buying at the top, right? So your some hedges. of the most profitable contracts I ever signed in the power business, it was 2013, Polar Vortex. The best. Every, the phone's ringing off the hook. I was cold calling 150 people a day and then... To go from like never having inbound calls to inbound calls, it's crazy. We had a couple calls last week, and this will go to your point on sophistication of miners, where uh, these clients all have projects either in um, Western SPP or in West Texas or South Texas. And we said, hey, the curtailment 
is you know been subsided because low gas prices haven't been or you know low gas prices are you know these are renewable customers renewable to yeah. renewable projects therefore the basis you know between their project location and the settlement hub has gone from fifteen dollars down to five dollars and last year they said hey anything around ten dollars we're buying and now we say hey what about are you buying five dollars now and they say no the one customer who said hey we're going to hedge the back half of 2023 is a bitcoin miner and they have large operations in the area and they are actively pursuing hedging in the area because they're being proactive instead of being reactive. And that was very refreshing to hear someone think about that um, as opposed to the conversation where things are going great. They're going to keep going great. Mm -hmm. But I know from your podcast and we've been in the markets for a little bit now, everything's cyclical. Oh, it doesn't matter what market you're in. Yeah, it, it's everything is. Especially in energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, and, think about in our world, right? Like when things are going well, you're just not losing money. But when things are going poorly, you're losing money. Like the gas world is probably a little different, right? You can mm -hmm. probably make a little wider on your spark spread when things are going well. You can recoup some, right? You can, what is he saying? Spark spread. so smart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We usually keep him. We usually keep him behind the curtain. I'm not a trader. It's the, the first time he's talked yeah. to yeah. people in years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Spark spread is the implied difference between your cost of generating power and what you're getting paid. Okay. Now I know. This is like the more you know kind of deal. Everybody Dollar needs to get themselves secure. Two dollars <laughs> per megawatt hour. Okay. Okay. I yeah. Get that. Karen, get that. Karen's what makes it all all work behind the scenes, I, but. Yeah. Um, in the end, you need you need people that understand both things, but then you also need the translator as well too. <laughs> so, <laughs> thankfully, we met. That, thankfully, we met Cam right away. So Cam he tra a translated a lot of the honestly, Bitcoin yeah, mining yeah, stuff yeah, and, yeah. and made us understand it, and, uh, well, and vice you're versa. Unique. You come from kind of both both sides of it, so there's not very many people in the space that have both sides of that. So, and, and I'm just scratching the surface with my knowledge. You know, mm. the things I've learned from these guys in the past year, it's mind blowing. Is that how long you guys have been working together? About a year? Yeah. Conversations is probably about a year at this point. Yeah, we started um, kind of right before uh, Bitcoin 2023. So what's that like April or May of 2021? 22, yeah. Bitcoin 22. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. 22. So yeah, we've come. We've definitely come a long way. We've yeah. grown. We, we were not insulated from the energy crisis yeah. that hit yeah. worldwide. I don't think anybody was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we didn't. We didn't back off uh, we, we when everything had, happened last we, year. We, we probably down. had signal on it, you know, mm. with some European stuff, and still, still ate a little bit. Yeah, as and as we all did in the every, space. Yeah, everybody did. There, I, I, it was not avoidable at that point. But hey, we uh, I think we need we need to wrap this one up. Yeah. We got, Alana's here. Yeah, Alana's here. She's been waiting, but um, it's the I'm, marathon continues. The marathon, the marathon continues. continues I'm cutting myself off for the rest of yeah, the time. Power to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a champion. Yeah, this is what you three so podcasts. I was so quiet. I was like, I was like, oh god, I gotta pull myself out of this. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you guys for coming. Thanks for this having really us. Good. This has been great. A really enlightening. We're gonna shut the camera off. I'm gonna, we're gonna have to catch up and Absolutely. get some deals going. We're so, looking forward to uh, for what Wednesday, Thursday. This Wednesday, week. Thursday. Yeah. It's gonna be yep. a good week, man. Yeah. And power round two, round power, two. Let's conferences do it. and power podcasts. The, you guys have done the, tremendously. Yeah, we've, we've been having fun. It's been a blast. Yeah, Thank you guys for making time. it down. I'm, I'm glad you guys organized this and uh, I wanted to make it happen. So we'll do it again too. We should yeah. definitely do it again. Yeah, we haven't had a repeat guest yet. So I'm gonna go uh, study more about the just the broader energy markets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for the I'm next gonna go study. Sparks. You need to get yourself a cure. Quite so retarded. Yeah, we need a cure. It's like the quant, right? The quant. Uh, I'm not a quant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kier, we oh, have quants. Yeah, Kieran's the translator I'm between the quants and us. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so you're like uh, Ryan Gosling in the big, the big. Uh, <laughs> what is it? What is it? The big short. The big short. The big short. Yeah. Look at him. This is my quant. Uh, yeah that's yeah we'll, we'll stop it yeah, we'll there, stop there. there. <laughs> we'll stop it there but yeah well thank you guys thank you it was a good thank time. you if you yeah. guys like the show please take two seconds share it with your friends all your colleagues send it to everybody you work with leave us a rating review much love we appreciate all the love so far catch you guys in the next episode